Sharon was unhappy. In fact, she was angry, angry at me, her husband. My name is Frank, Frank Miller. How did I know she was mad at me? It's simple. As I drove us home from a party hosted by a couple she knew, Anne and Hank Vanderlink, she sat huddled in her seat, as far away from me as possible, with a scowl on her face that could turn milk sour. Why was she so angry with me? Well, to be honest, I think she had a right to it, since I just completely ruined her evening. What a bore, right? I should be ashamed for disgracing my wife, the mother of my three children. Shame on me, shame on me. Okay, so how did I embarrass her and ruin her evening? I pulled out the wrong key. You see, there is an eccentric part to the parties that the Wonderlings throw. An eccentric part that my beloved wife suddenly decided to take part in. Unfortunately for her, I wanted no part of it. We had never been to one of their parties before. But my wife had heard about them and managed to get an invitation through a friend of a friend. My wife of ten years forgot to tell me that the party we were going to that night was going to end differently than most parties. She forgot to tell me in advance that at this party all the wives were to put their house keys in a ball, and after the keys were thoroughly mixed, the husbands were too, without looking, take a random key from the bowl and escort the wife to whom this key belonged to her bedroom and to her bed in the bedroom for the whole night of carnal, adulterous pleasures. As the party was ending and I suddenly found out what was going to happen, I almost went crazy. I've never been so angry with Sharon before. I grabbed her hand and dragged her to the kitchen. Did you know this party would end like this? She looked at me with a smirk on her face. Yes. And you didn't think to let me in on this little detail before we came here? No, because I knew that you would not agree to this if you had no choice. You're damn right. I won't agree with this. And I always have a choice. Let's go from here. Frank, we can't leave now. It would be impolite. You'll put me in an awkward position. Besides, it's only for one night. It will bring some excitement back into our marriage. I can do without this kind of excitement. Now, let's apologize and get out of here. We really need a little excitement, Frank. I need a little excitement. Just for one night, I want to be a woman, not just a wife and mother. It's just one night, once and will never happen again. Besides, I've already put the key to our house in the bowl, so it's too late to back out now. It's not too fucking late. Just look at me and I took her hand and practically dragged her back to the living room where everyone was gathered around a bowl filled with keys ready to choose their date for the night. Sharon pulled away, trying to free herself from my grip. I let go of her, walked over to the bowl, and said quite loudly, Sorry, but I was not informed about this part of the night's entertainment, and I do not plan to share my wife with any of you. I started rummaging through the bowl until I found the key to our house that my wife had placed there, the one with the red plastic cover on the head. I took it out of the bowl and turned to face the surprised group of partygoers. As I said, I was not informed of the rules of this party before my wife brought me here. I don't believe in adultery, and my wedding vows are sacred to me. There was some grumbling and a few angry faces staring at me, but I didn't care. I turned to look at my wife who was white with anger. Sharon, you have a choice, but you have to make a decision right now. Come with me and forget about this madness, or stay and never come home again. I'm leaving. All eyes turned to my wife, whose face was now bright red with embarrassment. She looked defiant for a moment. I apologize to all of you for my husband's rude behavior. I would love to stay, but obviously under the circumstances it's better for me to leave and she reluctantly and angrily followed me to the car. You are an insufferable, selfish idiot, she yelled at me. How dare you embarrass me like that in front of these people? We will never be invited there again. Embarrass you, Sharon? What about how you embarrassed me by not letting me in on your little plan to sleep with another man tonight? Well, you could grab one of the other wives so we could both have a good time. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I don't want another woman, Sharon. I reserve this very private activity for my wife. And I'm more than a little dismayed to learn after ten years of marriage 
that you want to share your bed with another man. It would be just one time, Frank, out of all the hundreds of married nights that we have spent and will spend together, it would be just one night with another partner. It's not a big ask, considering I've been a good wife for the last ten years. Actually, Sharon, this is a very big request. I can't believe what I'm hearing, but it really means a lot to you, doesn't it? Yes, Frank, that's true. I've been waiting for this for weeks. One night where I don't have to be a wife and mother, I'll be a woman having an adventure, being adored and having sex with another man for a few hours. You mean your only night where you have sex with someone other than your husband? Yes, I guess. I slammed on the brakes, spun 180 degrees in the middle of the street, and made my tires squeal as I sped back toward Vanderlink's house. Sharon squealed when I made an ooh. What are you doing, Frank? If spending one night having sex with another man means that much to you, Sharon, then you might just do it. I stopped in front of their house. It turned out that all the other cars were still there. Looks like it's not too late for you to get involved, so get out. Get out and enjoy your night. Have sex with some strange guy. I hope you find someone with a lot of manhood in their pants who can do for you what I obviously can't. Frank, this is just an adventure, something new. Your asset is the perfect size, and you always do the right things to me. But you know that I can't go to them alone. We both have to participate. Each of us must spend the night with a new partner. I told you I don't want any part of this, Sharon. I have never cheated on you and will never have sex with another woman until we are no longer married. What does it mean? It means exactly what I said. It's time to make a decision, Sharon. So if you're going to do this, get out and go to your adulterous friends. I have no doubt that they will find a place for a beautiful woman in their small circle, even if she is not accompanied by a husband. Sharon put her hand on the doorknob and stopped. I could see the wheels turning in her brain. Her voice softened. Could you come pick me up in the morning, Frank? You know, at whichever man's house I end up at? I'll call you and let you know where I am. It would be so sweet. It would mean a lot to me. No way in the world, but I'm sure your new lover will be happy to take you somewhere after he rides you all night. It sounds so ugly when you say that, Frank. He won't be my lover. He'll just be a man I have sex with, someone new, to experience the novelty. For one night, that's all. I love you, Frank. You are the only man I have ever loved or will ever love. You seriously believe this, don't you? There is no way you can love me and do what you plan. Let me make sure I understand correctly. You say you're just looking for someone new to fuck you with, right? As a result of this, another man will be ready to impregnate you. That's rude, Frank. You know I'm on pills, so that's impossible. He's not going to get me pregnant, but yeah, just one little night with someone new. It will be exciting. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to look into someone's new face while you have her? Just a new experience, new sensations, everything so new and unusual. Wait and see. Our lovemaking will improve from now on. Well, enjoy the way the new guy has you and the new sensations he gives you, Sharon. I hope you know what you're doing. It's just one night, Frank. It's not that much. One second would be too much. We have the rest of our life together ahead of us. We'll never have anything together again if you do this. I'm asking you, I'm begging you for the last time, Sharon, don't do this. You're overreacting, Frank, and I stand by my point. I won't let you ruin my night. I want to spend some time with someone new, and you can't stop me. I'm going to do this, and you just have to accept it and deal with it. Do you understand me? Tomorrow morning I will be completely yours again and make you forget everything that ever happened. Tomorrow morning you will be history. I will never want you again after you allowed another man to have what I have always considered my personal property. Now you're just being stupid. I am only yours, and you will also want me. I will take care of that. Sharon, look at me. I'm completely serious. If you get out of that car and go back to that house, it's all over between us. Your one night will cost you your husband and your family. No, that won't happen, Frank. I won't allow it. We are married and will always be married. We belong to each other. I love you and I know how much you love me. We'll get through this, you'll see. I will make amends to you a thousand times. You're breaking my heart, Sharon. Don't be like a big child. Just look at it as if you're taking me on an exciting adventure. Exciting for you is a tragic end for us. 
You're talking nonsense again, Frank. I'll make you change your mind in the morning, and you know how I'll do it. Do you really believe that I would touch your stinking body after you spend the night having sex with some stranger? You will touch me and more. I will take care of that. God, I never realized how stupid you are. Get out. My words shocked her, but she opened the car door and started to get out. See you in the morning, Frank. I shook my head sadly and sighed. No, Sharon, I won't see you. And as soon as she pushed the door to close it, I stepped on the gas pedal and made the tires squeal again, this time for half a block as I pulled away from her. I glanced at her in the rearview mirror as I sped down the street. She looked completely dazed, standing on the side of the road in shock, her mouth open and still not moving when I turned the corner and she was out of sight. In my heart of hearts, I hoped that she would call me right away and tell me that she had made a mistake and wanted me to come back and get her. But she didn't. I was heartbroken and overwhelmed. Tears streamed down my cheeks and blurred my vision. My wife just chose a night of sex with a man she had never met over the ten years of marriage we had. From the way she acted, I'm sure she really believed that I would survive her little prank. Oh, she probably thought that I would be angry with her and sulk for a couple of days. Then she would reveal her charms and drag me into bed, and all would be forgiven. Well, she was damn wrong. My dad told me years ago that if a woman is seriously thinking about having sex with another man, she has already done it in her mind. If a married woman was seriously thinking about it, she had already broken her vows. Of course, it's normal to see a cute guy and wonder what he'll be like in bed. But if she's thinking about how to make it happen, she's already cheated on you. As much as this thought kills me, it killed our marriage and it's time to move on. The main tragedy in all of this is our three children, nine-year-old Jocelyn, eight-year-old Rebecca Ann, and four-year-old Frank Jr. How can I live without them every day of my life? But I can't let what Sharon did go without serious consequences for her. The kids were at my mother's for the weekend, so I had time to figure out my next steps. I drove aimlessly for half an hour, still hoping that Sharon would call me to come and pick her up, but it quickly became clear that she had made up her mind. Finally, I decided on my initial plan and headed home. As soon as I pulled into the driveway, my cell phone rang. I was hoping it was her. She wanted me to come and get her, but the caller ID showed it wasn't Sharon. I answered the call anyway. The music and laughter of the party was playing in the background and a man spoke. Frank, old man, this is Rick Wilson from the party you ran away from. Your beautiful wife gave me your phone number. I guess she's hoping I can talk some sense into you. She's a hot girl and excited about what's in store for her tonight. That's all she says. You're a very lucky person. Every man here hopes that he gets her key. She keeps saying that one of the men will have an unforgettable night, and she wants you to experience it too. Things are heating up here. Everyone is ready to find out who they are going to spend the night with. You still have time to come back here and choose a key. There are some hot ladies who want to give you a wild time tonight. Fuck you, Rick Wilson, you wife-manipulating bastard. And everyone else at your little party can go to hell with you, including my slut wife. I hope you all die a terrible death. I passed out and headed into the house. It took me less than 20 minutes to pack two suitcases with enough clothes to last me a week or two. I grabbed my laptop and shaving kit and loaded it all into the car. I searched through a couple of drawers before I found our marriage certificate and tore it into four pieces and then grabbed a hammer for my wedding ring. It took a few hits before I actually flattened it, but once I did, I placed the certificate and ring on Sharon's pillow locked the front door behind me, and drove off into the night. I wanted to find a motel a few miles out of town, but first I drove past the Vanderlinks one more time. Several cars had already left the party, and there were a handful of people standing in the street in pairs and chatting. I didn't see Sharon, so I assumed she had either already moved on with her new lover or had managed to get paired with Mr. Vanderlink himself. The motel I stayed at was in a nearby town. It didn't look that big, but there was a parking lot in the back where prying eyes wouldn't be able to find my car in case anyone even wanted to look for me. 
I locked the car, bought a six-pack of Newcastle from the convenience store next door, and decided to watch some TV. The first two drinks relaxed me, and I was opening the third, when my phone rang. It was Sharon, and since I was sure she wasn't calling me so I could come and pick her up, I let it go to voicemail. Frank, you're acting like a big kid about this. Rick Wilson told me what you told him. How many times do I have to tell you that it's just one night? I'll just let one new guy fuck me a few times and that doesn't make me a fallen woman. I swear, even if it hurts a little, I will make it up to you in ways you can't imagine when I get home tomorrow. You probably don't care, but since you took our house key out of the bowl, they gave me a new one, and the guy who got it is named Glenn. He seems very nice and assures me that he won't force me to do anything I don't like. He is married, he has the same children as ours. Since you are at our house, I came to his house. His wife and her boyfriend will also stay here for the night, but in another part of the house, far enough away from us so that we won't hear each other when things get heated and we start making noise. You know how loud I can get when you touch me. And she giggled like a schoolgirl. Honey, I know you're a little upset about this, but I promise I won't let him do anything to me that you haven't done. I told Glenn that maybe we should just stick to normal things, you know. He has met me a few times, probably mostly in missionary or something else for variety. Glenn agreed, especially since this was my first time with another man. He says he'll take me home when we finish tomorrow. I will make sure to shower and rinse off before I come home to be clean and fresh for you. No sloppy seconds for you, baby. Sweet dreams, my love. See you in the morning. Get ready for some hot action. Love you, Frank. I thought I was going to rip my guts out. Never in my life did I realize that I was married to such a stupid and fallen woman. Sure, Sharon had always been a little flighty, but that was part of her sweet charm. Now this stupidity was exaggerated and cost her life along with her husband and, possibly, children. She just couldn't believe that I wouldn't take her back after she let some guy have her and rub it in my face. I'm sure everyone at the party had a great time at my expense. I was angry, hurt, and humiliated. But my wife didn't care. I know I should have just ignored her message, but I just couldn't. I called her back, and she picked up on the third ring. Hey, honey. Glenn and I just got into bed and are getting comfortable with each other, so I can't talk for long. Shut the fuck up, Sharon. This is most likely the last you will ever hear from me. You have no idea what you just did, but you'll find out soon enough. You better really enjoy sex with this guy, Glenn, because the price will be higher than anything you imagined. Understand this, Sharon. Once you sleep with Glenn, our marriage is over, you hear me? It's over. I never thought I'd say this, but I hate you more now than I've ever loved you. I can't wait to get rid of you completely. My lawyer will serve you next week. And I hung up. Thirty seconds later, my phone rang. It was her. I let it go to voicemail again. Frank. She sounded as if she was about to cry. Why are you acting like this? How can you tell me such things? I am your wife. Why can't you just let me have this night? Glenn and I are just getting started and now you're ruining everything for me. And I don't know if I can fully enjoy being with him the way I want. We are not going to get divorced. I'll be home in the morning and we can work things out. I would have returned home now, but I promised Glenn that I would be with him at night. Please try to understand that I have to do this. He got my key, and I promised him right then that he could sleep with me. And he really wants to do it now. Oh, uh, yes. Right now, while I'm talking to you, I have to go. Oh, God, Glenn is ready. Oh, I love you, Frank. I will always love you. Please don't say that when I do this to him. Our marriage will end. There's nothing I can do about it, honey. He's already here. Oh, God. Please. Oh, yes. Please try to understand. And I heard her whisper to him. Fuck me, Glenn. This is my night. See you in the morning, dear. And again, I just couldn't help myself. I called her back and this time the phone rang several times before going to voicemail. It was obvious Glena already had it, so I left a message. After listening to your last voicemail, I can tell that Glenn already has you and you love it. You can spend the night looking into his face and feeling all the new sensations he gives you. You have completely broken my heart, Sharon. And I will never forgive you for that. 
It's great that you were able to keep your promise to Glenn, a man you just met, but couldn't keep your marriage vows to the man who loved you and was faithful to you for over ten years. I don't even know who you are. You won't see me in the morning. You may never see me again. But next week you'll be served with divorce papers and I'll charge you with adultery. Now that you're having sex with Glenn, what were you allowed to do? Just me? You're officially a cheating slut. From now on you can have sex with any man you want, as often as you want. But just in case you care, you've lost me forever, and that's a promise I'll definitely keep. Sharon didn't call me back. I know how turned on she gets when she has sex. She goes into a special world where everything and everyone doesn't matter. There's only her and the man who has her. I don't know if she got my last message, but it didn't matter. The damage was done. Our marriage was over. I would never take her back after she treated me so disrespectfully, humiliated me, and made a mockery of our marriage. I finished off the rest of the six-pack. I didn't want to spend the whole night imagining my wife lying naked on Glenn's bed, the woman who until tonight had been all mine. Sharon was loud during sex, and I was sure she would scream for Glenn to fuck her. That's what she did to me, and I'm sure that's what she did to Glenn. Anyway, the beer took effect, and I fell asleep, tears still flowing from my eyes. I woke up about four hours later, and reality hit me. My beautiful wife had an affair, and I needed to come up with a plan to protect my children, get her out of my life, and make as many people at this party miserable as possible. We live in Biloxi, Mississippi, a beautiful antebellum area on the Gulf Coast. And since Mississippi is one of the states where adultery is a reason for divorce, I could avoid paying child support and maybe even get custody of my children. I needed a lawyer, a very good lawyer. I showered, changed, and called my mom at 7.30 to let her know what was going on. She was just as shocked by Sharon's action as I was. My kids were with her for the weekend and she promised not to tell them anything. I told her I would pick them up as soon as I had a plan. I thought that Sharon would probably be granted custody, at least for now. I hated to admit it, but she was a good mother to her children. And a good wife to me. That is, until last night. As soon as I got off the phone with my mom, I headed to a diner a block away from the motel to get breakfast. And before I could park and head out the door, my phone rang. It was Sharon. I thought about answering but changed my mind and went to voicemail, only she didn't leave a message. Instead, she called back immediately, and when I didn't answer, she called again and again, until finally, on the fifth ring, she left a message. She was crying. Damn it, Frank, answer the damn phone. Talk to me, damn you. What do you mean I might never see you again? And what is all this bullshit about divorce? Papers? You can't leave me, Frank. I won't let you. We have three precious little ones who need us both. My God, Frank. Why did you tear up our marriage certificate and destroy your beautiful wedding ring? How could you do that? I gave you this ring the day we got married, and you promised to wear it forever. It is a symbol of our eternal love for each other. I knew you'd be a little upset with me, but I never thought you'd go this far. I love you so much, Frank. I just really needed that special night with Glenn, and it was special... He made me feel like a young girl again. I've already forgotten what it's like to laugh and scream at the same time. But as great as last night was, you are my man, Frank, my only man. And I know how to make it up to you and make your little grudges go away. Come home, Frank, so I can prove to you how much I love you. Come home and bring me back. At this point, she began to sob and was difficult to understand. Damn you, Frank. Why can't you understand that I just needed one night with someone new? Needed to feel something new with another man who wanted me and wanted me? It was so nice to know that another man desires me and thinks that I am beautiful enough, that he just can't wait to fuck me, to take possession of me. You don't understand how nice it is for a woman my age to see a man get excited and understand that she made it so that he wants her. Oh, please, Frank, you have to understand that it was just sex, that's all, he just fucked me. Please, Frank, talk to me. I love you. You and our children are my life. Her voice was getting weaker. It was just sex, Frank. Oh, God, all he did was fuck me a few times. Once, we were just having sex. That's all, Frank. And she continued to sob, and the message ended. I stood outside the diner door in complete shock. 
had she had these thoughts our whole married life, and now, after thirty, it all suddenly came to light? Sharon is still a beautiful woman, five five, one hundred and thirty lie bees, shoulder length dark brown hair, light blue eyes, stunning figure. Her breasts aren't too big, but they're not small. And yes, her hips have gotten a little bigger after having three kids, but she still attracts the attention of guys wherever she goes. So what is this nonsense she is talking about, about needing to feel desired and desired by another man? I always showed her how much I love and desire her. I bring her flowers and go out with her at least once a week. I buy her sexy negligees and tell her every day how beautiful she is and how much I love her. And until last night, our sex life was amazing. Or so I thought. We made love at least three times a week, and I always brought it to one or more peaks. What the hell did I miss? I lost my appetite, but I walked into the diner anyway, found an empty table, and ordered scrambled eggs, toast, and black coffee. I ate less than half of my breakfast, but drank at least six cups of coffee. Never in my life have I felt so lost, so empty, so defeated. I had heard people say that they wished they were dead, and now I knew what they meant. The only thing that made me want to live further was the thought of my children. I had to live for them. I had to go through this hell that Sharon created and create a future for them. This thought alone filled me with determination. I'll get through this. I just need to figure out how to do it. Sharon called my phone at least 20 times that day, and I always sent it to voicemail. She begged me to understand, but never once said she was sorry for what she had done. She never said she had made a mistake, only that she needed this one night, and my job was to understand and support her. All they did was have sex, and only three times a night and again in the morning. That's all. How can I not see that this was all just a one-night stand, easily forgiven and forgotten, she said she was afraid she didn't turn off her phone in time and I might have heard them start with Glenn. She hoped I didn't hear too much. I had to give her credit. She really knew how to plunge a knife into my heart and twist the blade. I couldn't believe she really was that stupid. I think if there was one good thing, it was that I now had enough audio evidence of her adultery to use against her in court. I wasn't sure if the audio evidence would be enough, but it was really compelling and left nothing to the imagination. Tomorrow I will find a good lawyer and find out everything I need to know. I went to visit my children at my mother's. She said Sharon had already called to see how the kids were doing and to ask her if she knew where I was. Mom told her that I was broken because of what she did and I didn't want to see her or talk to her. She said Sharon started crying, saying, I just don't understand. And my mom told her that no man would understand how a wife could throw a night of sex with another man in her husband's face. Sharon wanted to know if she should come and pick up the kids, but my mom said it would be best for her to keep them for a few more days until things calmed down a bit. The children were happy to see me, but wanted to know where their mother was. I told them that their mother was busy with a special project that was important to her and that they would be staying with their grandmother for a few more days. I played with them and we had dinner together, then I hugged and kissed them goodbye and headed back to my motel. Tomorrow will be a busy day. I had one stop before I was done for the day. Well, actually, one drive passed. I drove past my house, and as soon as I saw it, tears came to my eyes again. I cried for what I had lost and would never get back. I was a little surprised to not see any strange cars parked in the driveway. Of course, there could have been some guy's car in the garage, but since the only light was on downstairs in the kitchen, I was sure that Sharon was alone at least tonight. And then it dawned on me that I still cared about her. No, I wouldn't take her back. She made sure of that. But it still hurt me deeply to think that she betrayed me the way she betrayed me with another man. I tried to resist the temptation to stop and spy on her, but I couldn't resist. I parked a block away and walked back to the side where I could look out the kitchen window. She was sitting at the table. An empty bottle of Grey Goose stood next to her. Her hair was a mess and it looked like mascara was running down her face. She was dressed in a robe. Her head lay on the table facing me. Her eyes were closed. It was obvious she was crying and was surrounded by what looked like the contents of a box of tissues. For a second I felt sorry for her. Then I remembered what she willingly did to me and to our children, and my blood froze in my veins. 
I wanted to scream at her, but instead I returned to my car and drove away. I did feel a little satisfaction. Maybe she was really starting to understand what she had done. In any case, if she wanted someone to take pity on her, she could call her lover Glenn. Monday came early, and I had a lot to do. Breakfast at the diner consisted of eggs and toast with black coffee, but this time I ate it all. I called my mom and spoke to each of my children, letting them know that I loved them and would see them soon. I then called my office and told my assistant that I would be dealing with personal issues for the next two days, and if anything important needed my attention, she should call or text me. She asked me if something was wrong and I told her, yes, but I'll explain later. During my senior year at Ole Miss, I shared an apartment with two close friends, Douglas Prater III and Maxwell McRae. We became best friends, and although we only got to meet occasionally, we kept in touch with each other over the years. I got a degree in computer science while Doug got a degree in business administration, and Max became a lawyer. First, I called Doug and asked him if he and Max could meet me for drinks at about five. I told him I needed their advice on an important matter, and Doug agreed to contact Max and meet me at the lava bar on the beach. I got there early. Max arrived a little after five, and Doug showed up ten minutes later. We greeted each other warmly and found a table on the patio, ordered beers, and toasted each other. What's the matter, Frank? Doug asked. Your phone call seemed important to me. Sharon cheated on me and rubbed it in my face, I told them, and then told them everything. God, this is hard, man, Doug said. I just can't believe she did something like that, Max added. Me neither, but she did it without any shame or remorse, and she still thinks I'm overreacting. Can you believe this shit? So what are you going to do? Max asked me. I want a divorce and I would like to punish Glenn, whoever he is, and the rest of those idiots at the party, but more importantly, I want to try to get custody of my children. It might not be easy, Frank, Max said, unless she was a bad mother. I mean, if she brings strange men into your house and has sex while the kids are there, then you have options. Otherwise, you're saying she's a good mother, so she'll likely get custody and you'll pay child support. I can live with it as long as I can see them as often as I like. It's doable, Max said. The courts want both parents to participate in raising children as long as both are good parents. What about finances? Doug chimed in. Sharon is a stay-at-home mom, and I'm guessing you make a pretty good six-figure salary. How big are your bank accounts? Checking and savings? Any investments? 401k? Individual retirement account? All of the above, and I think it all adds up to 700 or 800,000, maybe a little more. The court will most likely split it strictly in half, give Sharon the house and custody, but if you can prove that she committed adultery, and it seems to me that you have a pretty strong argument you won't have to pay alimony. Do you know a really, and I mean really, good divorce lawyer? In fact, one of the partners in my firm is one of the best family law attorneys in Mississippi. Her name is Maddie Simmons. Do you want me to make an appointment for you? Of course, and the sooner the better. In the meantime, Doug said, I'll see what we can do to protect some of your money. Send me every dollar of your information and I'll take care of it. We toasted each other again, drank a little more, and said goodbye. I suddenly felt better than I ever had since this whole mess started. As I was driving back to my motel, my mind buzzing with everything I needed to do, my cell phone rang, and it was Sharon. I thought for a second, then realized I would have to talk to her eventually, so I pulled over and answered. What do you want, Sharon? I decided not to beat around the bush and get down to business right away. What do you think I want, Frank? I want my husband to come home where he belongs. I could tell she was crying. Well, unfortunately for you, your little, as you called it, your little fun with Glenn makes it impossible for me to return home. She burst into sobs. Don't say that, Frank. Don't you dare say that. I only spent one night away from you after ten years, and that is not grounds for divorce. Think again. Adultery is definitely grounds for divorce in Mississippi. Why do you keep calling it cheating? It was just one night with someone new, just a fling. When a married woman gets involved with someone new, whether it's for one night or one second, it's cheating. I told you that the second you had sex with another man, it would be over between us, and I wasn't kidding. Oh God, please, Frank, you can't do this to me. 
You did this to yourself, Sharon. What the hell happened to you? Are you on hallucinogenic drugs? Did you have a mental breakdown or are you just incredibly stupid? It just seems to me that you were so caught up in the idea of having sex with another man that you didn't care about our children or what I thought or wanted. You just had to do it. Well, guess what? You did it and now you're paying the consequences. I thought we were really happy, nice house, three great kids. Our sex life was great. And then you ruined it all by sleeping with some stranger and rubbing it in my face. We have always been happy, Frank, and we are happy now. I was just wondering what it would be like to be with another man for one dirty night in our long life together. Just try someone new without harm, that's all. No harm? For some reason you don't understand at all what harm you have caused. You completely destroyed our family overnight because of your selfishness. You have broken our life into a million pieces, and there is no hope of ever putting them back together again. First of all, Sharon, you broke my heart, even though you made it clear that you didn't care. Remember me, your husband, the man who loved you without any doubt from the moment he first saw you, a person who works long hours every day to give you and your children the life you dream of. You spat in my face and left me to find yourself in the arms and bed of a complete stranger. You gave him those parts of your body that ten years ago you swore that they would belong only to me. You took this oath before God, before our families and all our friends. Moreover, last night you rubbed it in my face, letting me know that you were going to do it, no matter how much I begged you not to do it. You basically told me to get the hell out, you do whatever you want, and it's none of my business. I never meant for it to look like this, Frank. I don't know why, but I didn't think I was hurting you. I just wanted to do something new. I love you. It was never about you. It was what I needed. And that's what brought you here. You took your husband out of the equation. All your cheating with Glenn last night concerned only you and him. You didn't think about me or your children. I deserve a special night just for myself. Well, fortunately for you, your royal highness, you got it, and it cost you, your marriage to me, and very likely your reputation among your family and friends. There may come a day when I forgive you, but I will never forget, and I'm going to tell everyone what you did. Just like you called me a big brat for being upset about your adultery, I'll see how you react, knowing that everyone will hear you confess that you did it to Glenn and how many times you did it. Oh God, Frank, please, you can't do this. My parents will die if they hear this. Too bad, Sharon, you should have thought about that before you did it. You made your bed, filled it with shit, and now you can lie in it. You seem to think that what you did is like getting a traffic ticket or not returning a library book. You traded a really strong 10-year marriage with a man who adored you for late-night sex, with a complete stranger who only cared about instant gratification. Don't you feel good, Sharon, that Glenn fucked you four times and it cost you your family? I didn't have to lose anything, Frank. You should have loved me enough to support me and let me do it. There is not a single sane man on this planet who would support his wife in an affair just because she wanted to try someone new at night. It doesn't work that way, and you should have known it. What were you thinking, Sharon? That made you do this. I didn't think you'd be so upset about this. I mean, seriously, Frank, what's so bad about letting another man fuck me multiple times? And what I did to Glenn last night doesn't mean I love you any less. I'd heard about couples getting together at Vanderlinks and that somehow attracted me. Why can't a husband or wife share an intimate night with a complete stranger, someone nice and safe, enjoy sex with him or her, and experience new feelings, new sensations? I decided that I wanted and needed to experience another man having sex with me. It didn't mean I loved you any less, Frank. It just meant I needed a new experience with a new man just once, and then I would commit myself to you again and never do it again. But that meant you didn't respect me. I asked you over and over again, begged you not to do this, and you just smiled and said, See you in the morning, Frank. You have deprived me of the intimacy that you and I shared together for over ten years. The vows that meant so little to you mean everything to me. The union of our bodies created three beautiful children who love us both. Together, we were a family. We belonged exclusively to each other, 
And now you willingly gave that part of yourself that joined with me to create these children to another man. And for what? For a good time? For a little special one-night stand? You say it was just one night and I need to accept it and come to terms with it. I say it was nothing less than a complete and utter abandonment of me, your family, your sacred oath of loyalty and allegiance, and any respect that you've ever felt for me. You wanted to fuck another man, and you did it. Congratulations, you made it. But what you really did, Sharon, was throw everything you supposedly valued and treasured into the gutter. Part of me still loves you, but I will never be a part of your life again. Damn it, Frank. Why are you so stubborn? Why can't you understand that it was just what I needed and come to terms with it? I'm yours forever. Nothing has changed. Everything has changed, Sharon. You are not only mine now. I don't know why you can't understand that this was something I begged you not to do. I cannot forgive and forget you voluntarily betrayed me, and this wound will bleed for the rest of my life. I found a lawyer and tomorrow... I will feel e for divorce on grounds of adultery. I will name your lover Glenn in the divorce proceedings and every person at your little party that I can identify. And just imagine what the reaction will be when your adulterous friends find out that you are responsible for the breakup of their little club and possibly destruction of their reputations. Go to hell, Sharon, and take all your adulterer friends with you. The moment I walked into the office of Maddie Simmons, Esquire, I felt like I had found the right attorney to help me deal with the mess my life had become. She didn't do nonsense. She got straight to the point. She wanted to know what made me file for divorce and what results I would like to get from this action. I told her that I fully expected to give half of the material goods to Sharon, that I would try to make a deal by giving her our house in exchange for a slightly smaller amount of cash. I also realized that even by filing an affair, I probably wouldn't get full custody of my children, but I wanted unlimited access to them and didn't want to pay her child support. I played all the audio evidence I had of Sharon's betrayal, where she freely admitted over and over again that she and Glenn had sex all night long. Ms. Simmons shook her head over and over again, simply in disbelief that my wife was so naive that she couldn't believe that I was upset about her little affair, and even more so, that she willingly admitted her actions in a voice message, which could be used against her in court. We'll probably need to get a voice recognition expert to confirm that it's your wife's voice, she told me. But unless we get a really bad judge, the recordings should be used in court. We spent the rest of the hour discussing what I hoped to achieve against this guy, Glenn, and the others at the wife-swapping party. She doubted we could demand any monetary compensation from them, but we could probably find a way to publicize their little activities and shame them enough to cause them significant pain. I told her that this would be quite enough for me. I gave her a deposit and asked that Sharon be served as soon as possible. She said it wouldn't take long and she would let me know before it happened. On Tuesday afternoon, I picked up my kids from my mom and took them to Sharon's house. When she opened the door, she hugged and kissed all three of them tightly and then reached out to me but I backed away from her, causing her to burst into tears and ask me to stay. I told her I couldn't, but I thought it would be nice for the kids to come home to her and that I would pick them up on Friday to spend the weekend with me. Sharon looked like she was having a hard time, and I felt for her, but she brought it on herself and the bad times she was going through were no worse than what I was going through because of her. On Wednesday, I returned to work. I knew I couldn't neglect my work. I needed her now more than ever, not only for the money, but also as a distraction. I felt that if I continued to wallow in the pain and self-pity of Sharon's betrayal, I would eventually go crazy, which I couldn't do for the sake of my children. On Thursday, I met up with Doug and Max again, this time for dinner at the Oyster House, where I enjoyed hand-shucked oysters and a dirty martini. Over dinner and drinks, I brought them up to date about my children and the divorce. Doug analyzed possible ways to hide some of my money, and I gave him permission to do so. It wouldn't be much, but it would help in the long run. We agreed and came up with a relatively simple way to cause problems at the wife-swapping club without running the risk of being accused of slander. Max had a good friend who was a reporter for the Biloxi Sun-Herald. 
He was confident that if I gave him the location of Vanderlink's house and the approximate time that the wife-swapping group met, he could learn the names of at least some of the participants and write an editorial about how the Biloxi wife-swapping was on a larger scale than most believed. Residents and publishing a few photos of couples scurrying back and forth, hinting at the owners of certain businesses that may be involved without naming names, will be enough for the religious majority to raise enough of a stink to cause pain for the entire group. I gave Max what little I had, and he said he'd start with that. With these joyful words, we shook hands and parted until next time. My weekend with the kids was wonderful. We went shopping for new clothes, went to Disney's Grand 18 movie theater in Dibberville, and spent the day at the beach swimming and playing frisbee. My children were the most important thing in my life, and I vowed that I would never leave them. On Monday morning, I got a call from Max. A friend of his from the newspaper liked the story idea and was working on taking photos of the couples who walked into Vanderlinks and the new couples who walked out together. Everyone's faces would have to be blurry, but people aren't stupid. And in a city this size, it wouldn't take long for the moral majority to piece it all together. If it all came together, it would be a front page story later this week. I have my fingers crossed. Sharon kept calling me, begging me to come home, promising that she would do anything and everything to make me forget about what she did, but she still never said she was sorry or admitted she made a mistake. On Wednesday, I heard first from my lawyer that Sharon would be served at our home on Friday morning, and then from Doug that he had found a way to hide about a third of my money by putting it in my children's names. Finally, Max called me and told me that his friend from the newspaper had done some digging and found that the wife-swapping swingers were going to meet again Friday night at Vanderlinks, and he planned to sit across the street in an unmarked van, taking pictures of everyone who came and went. He wanted to interview me again about what happened at the party, and if everything went according to plan, the article should appear in the newspaper next week. I felt better than I had in a long time. Friday came, and I waited for the call that I knew would come from Sharon after she received the divorce papers. And of course, I was not surprised. My lawyer called me at 2.30 to let me know that she had been served, and no more than 10 minutes later, my phone rang again, and the number told me it was my soon-to-be ex-wife. I smiled to myself. I wonder what she wants. I thought about sending the call to voicemail, but decided against it. Hi, Sharon. How are you? What the hell did you do, Frank? Her voice was not friendly. I filed for divorce from you, Sharon, which is what I told you I was going to do. And I told you that there will be no divorce. And you filed a report of treason? One night with another man is not cheating, Frank. I have to disagree with you on this issue, Sharon. Spending the night with a man who is not your spouse defines adultery in Mississippi. She started crying. Why are you so angry with me, Frank? I love you. All Glenn did was fuck me a few times. It was an affair, that's all. Oh, sorry, Sharon, it's my fault. I had the false idea that having sex with someone other than your husband was cheating. How could I possibly have made this terrible mistake? Give it up, Sharon, it's over. I warned you over and over again and begged you not to do this, but you did it anyway, and now you will have to pay. Moreover, I believe that you will soon discover that your problems are not over yet. Goodbye, Sharon. Have a happy life. And I ended the call. The biggest problem I had was that I still loved Sharon. It probably always would be, but I could never trust her again, and there was no way I was going to stay married to a cheater. I knew I should stay away from Vanderlink's Friday night party, but I couldn't resist the urge to drive by once just to see what was going on. I also wanted to see if Sharon's car was there, although I was pretty sure she would miss the party, at least this time. There was no sign of her car, of course she could have gone with someone else, and yes, I knew they only allowed couples to visit, but they made an exception for her once, and who's to say they wouldn't do it again? I did see a van parked across the street from the house and figured the reporter was out there somewhere. I wished him luck in pinning their asses. The results were not long in coming. The next afternoon, Max's friend, a reporter, called me asking for some information, which I gladly did. He told me that he had taken more than a hundred photographs and recognized more than a dozen couples of the city's finest citizens. And strangely enough, 
it seemed unlikely that exactly the same couples were leaving the house two hours later. Max gave him a photograph of my wife so he could recognize her, and he assured me that she was not one of the participants entering or leaving the Vanderlink house. He asked me to describe what I saw and experienced when I was in the house during one of the key parties, and I did my best to describe how the keys were placed in a large bowl, and although I never saw that part, where the men pulled out a random key and walked off with the woman who owned it, I got a clear idea of what was about to happen from my wife's description, as well as from overhearing another couple talk about their experiences at past parties. Before we said goodbye, he asked me if he could allude to the fact that he had first-hand knowledge of at least one marriage that had been ruined by partying and children suffering because of their parents' divorce. I told him to go until the names were called. The article appeared in the Sunday edition of the newspaper, and the proverbial shit hit the proverbial fan. Not only was the article on the front news page, with a large photo of the couples coming and going, their faces blurred out, but at least a dozen additional photos were spread across four more pages, and although every attempt was made to hide their faces, it was ridiculously easy to identify many of the participants due to the cars they drove and the clothes they wore. I mean, it was pretty much the cream of the crop in Biloxi. By Monday, the whole city was talking about the story and the parties. At least a half dozen priests gave radio and television interviews about the evil that had infiltrated their Christian community, and civic leaders condemned the Jewel of the South for its lost morals. Lawsuits and counterclaims were filed to no avail, prominent companies lost clients, and more than one couple found themselves in divorce court. For me, it was all funny a well-deserved retribution for the hell that I experienced due to the loss of my wife and the breakup of my family. And even if some people realized that I was being cuckolded, I wouldn't care. I got my revenge, and that's all that mattered, really. Sharon tried for months to get me to come back to her, but she never had a chance. The divorce was finalized, and I received joint custody of my children. During the months that I have them, Sharon gets them on the weekends, and vice versa when she has them. It's not the best deal in the world, but we're getting by. Oh yeah, since Sharon didn't argue with me on any part of the divorce, I let her off the hook and didn't share the audio of her admitting cheating with her family or friends. As for the couples who participated in the key parties, some of them got divorced and moved away. Maybe skipping town is a better word. As for Sharon and I, she started dating again. I'm still not sure she fully understands why I found her actions completely unacceptable, but that's her problem, and I wish whoever becomes her future husband the best of luck. I dated several very nice young women, but never found one I was willing to spend the rest of my life with. Some have wanted to move in with me, but I'm still a little hesitant when it comes to giving a woman a key. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.